So let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope that you had a restful break and were able to enjoy the holidays. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today for this important town hall discussion. Uh, over the past 22 months, we've come together for a number of town halls to discuss the pandemic. Uh, and the people who are gonna be participating are people who we've talked to in the past. Uh, you'll be hearing from Dr. Renit Mishari, who's the university's chief public health officer, as well as Professor Larry Gaston, who is one of the world's leading public health officers and are experts on public health. And uh, we at the law school and at the university have been working very closely with Dr. Mishari and Professor Gaston and the university's public health group in formulating our response to the pandemic. So I'm just delighted that they're joining us here today. And I'm also joined by our associate deans uh, who will be able to talk about uh, our responses to the questions that, uh, that you've asked. Um, I'll be focusing on, I'll be, uh, give you an overview. Um, Dr. Mishori and Professor Gostin will then talk about where the pandemic is now. Um, and then we'll move to questions. So we've received a, a number of questions over the past couple of days, and we'll also activate the uh, question and answer function so that you'll be able to answer questions live or ask questions live uh, during this town hall. Uh, and we have a hard stop at three o'clock, so we'll, but we'll try to cover as many of the questions as we can. Um, and we're also recording this so that people who are not able to participate uh, during the town hall will be able to watch uh, this, this discussion. So um, let me just say that we've received many questions and comments from faculty, students, and staff in response to the university's decision and the law center's decision to operate remotely uh, for, the, for the month of January. And, and many of the questions fall into one of two camps on opposite sides of the question. Some are unhappy about our remote start, and some would prefer that we be remote the entire semester. And I know that some of you are in one group or the other, and, and many of you are in between. So we're gonna be talking about why we followed the path that we followed it, as well as where the pandemic is now. As President DeJoya said in his email yesterday, the response to the Omicron surge was one of the most difficult operational choices we've had to make during two years of very difficult operational choices. It was just for me and, and for all of us, it was so gratifying to be back on campus together this fall. And I desperately wanted to return to being back on campus as we started the second semester. And I do want to emphasize at the outset that the decision to move to online classes and online operations through the end of January, through January 30th, was very different from our decision to go online in March of 2020 and our decision to go online that we made in the summer of 2020. Um, then we knew much less about the virus and we didn't have a vaccine. And our main concern was to present, prevent the virus's spread. This time, the decision to move to a short term of remote learning and remote operations was driven primarily by operational considerations. The high transmissibility of the Omicron variant, and you'll be hearing in more detail about it from Dr. Mishori, but the high transmissibility your transmissibility of the Omicron variant means that a large portion of our community is likely to catch the disease during the month of January, and many already have. The decision to move to remote teaching through January 30th was driven by the operational dis disruptions that the spread of Omicron is almost certain to cause. And those are disruptions that airlines and other industries are already experiencing. So, and we've begun to feel some of those disruptions already on our campus. Already, for example, a number of people in facilities and, and the campus police have tested positive. 
staff are needed to, in order for the campus to, to function. And we can't operate when a significant amount of our campus police or our facilities people are out. And you know, we similarly expect a significant portion of students and faculty to contract the Omicron variant in January. And our judgment is that in these circumstances, online education, as distinguished from a hybrid of in-person and remote learning, is the best way to provide a high quality legal education. And among other things, an online start will allow all of our students to begin the semester on, online and on an even playing field, which means everyone will have the same mode of instruction. So, uh, but I, I do wanna just emphasize that, you know, what we're seeing now is, is very different from what we were seeing in the fall with Delta. So uh, in, in the first three and a half months of the fall semester, end of August, September, October, November, the Law Center community had a total of 61 positive tests. In the past two weeks, we've had more than 150. So we're witnessing a real dramatic increase in transmission. And, and that's, uh, that underlies you know, what we've decided to do to move online uh, for January. Now, fortunately, the Omicron variant seems to be less severe than previous strains of COVID. And Dr. Mishori will talk more about that in a moment. A moment. But the disruption that we're seeing on campus in DC and around the country is occurring regardless of the severity of the disease as mandatory quarantine and the DC current 10-day mandatory isolation requirements illustrate. So the epidemiologists and other experts we regularly consult with have told us that in the District of Columbia, this disruption is likely to subside around the end of January. So this month will bring a large spike in cases and many of our faculty, staff, and students will be in quarantine or isolation in the coming weeks. But we also expect that the spike will be short-lived. And that's why we chose a target return date of January 31st. So we don't know what the future will hold. None of us can predict with certainty the course of this pandemic. And I'm very aware of the isolation that online learning can cause. As I said in my email, I'm hopeful that this interruption of our on-campus operations will be a short one. And I'm committed to return to in-person classes as soon as possible. And we'll continue to keep you posted. And I'll send you an operational update about the return to campus on Tuesday, January 18th. Tuesday, January 18th, you'll be hearing from me again about our return to campus. So. That's kind of my overview. Um, Dr. Mishori and Professor Gostin will talk about the, uh, the pandemic and then we'll open it up for questions. So uh, our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Mishori, could I turn matters over to you? Yes, thank you so much, Dean Trainer. Um, thanks for coming. And um, let me just share some, um, some slides with you. One second. Okay. So um, what I'd like to um, do today is review um, some of the, um, kind of give you a situational update from what we know at this point, um, given um, what's been going on for the last few months. And I'm saying that with a, an asterisk because um, Omicron hit us and um, we are about five or six weeks from some of the first cases and scientists across the world are working day and night um, to try to give us more information about Omicron and its different um, uh, features and characteristics. And so all of this science is brand new science. It's coming every day there we have new data. So the data that I'm presenting today is um, through about uh, January 5th, so yesterday, um, but things are changing very, very rapidly. And some of the guiding questions when you 
think about um, about Omicron and, and Omicron is, is, as uh, Dean Trainer mentioned, is very different. It's almost like a different creature than, than Delta and certainly Alpha before it. Um, but some of the guiding questions that we're all asking ourselves and using as a basis for making any policy decisions is, is it more transmiss transmissible? And again, very brief question uh, and answer is yes, absolutely, and extremely so. Is it more virulent? It's less, as we know so far, but there are there is a caveat there, and I'll talk about it in a second. Are the vaccines effective against it? And yes, they are to some extent, but much less so. And I'll talk about that also. Uh, it seems that a previous infection is not as protective. Um, it can be detected easily at this point through PCR, lesser extent through antigen testing. And then I'm also going to talk about the treatments um, who um, appear to be at this point less effective. So um, transmissibility, that's what everybody's talking about because we're seeing the numbers, the really, really staggering numbers. And when we think about transmissibility, we think about a concept called r naught. It's the um, it's a number that represents uh, one person having the virus, how many people it will transmit it to. This is on a population level and it differs by um, by setting, for example, a cruise ship, a prison, a university, uh, a nursing home um, will, because of its density, the R0 will be different. But when we think about Delta, it kind of sits right here um, with an R0 about five or so. Um, currently, Omicron is thought to be sitting somewhere around here. Very, very one of the most transmissible viruses uh, that we've known so far in, in recent history. Um, there are different numbers um, to look at from different settings in different countries, but it's uniformly uh, known now that the transmissibility is far, far greater um, than Delta and certainly uh, than Alpha before it in the original strain. Um, cases in different places are doubling every two to three days, and we've seen that in our data as well. So when we think about um, when we think about the numbers across the world, you can see that this uh, the, the the graphs basically shoot up straight um, and. Uh, this is happening in every country that is experiencing Omicron. I'm not representing all of them here, but ones that are a little bit more uh, similar to the United States in terms of um, uh, the uh, vaccination rates, uh, the type of population. And of course, in the US, uh, this is from this morning, we've surpassed all of the previous records in terms of um, cases, uh, but getting up there also in terms of hospitalizations, the only good news is that the death rate does not seem to follow those numbers, which is wonderful. DC, Maryland, Virginia, again, DC for uh, about a, a two weeks period or more was the number one um, place in the country in terms of the rate of uh, increase in the number of cases, still seeing a lot of cases right now, but Maryland, Virginia are following suit um, as the um, virus is spreading throughout the country. Um, this is um, the weekly case rate. As you can see, only three weeks ago, this was a very, very high peak. Um, and this is completely dwarfing it. This uh, dip here may be hopeful, maybe not, because um, we don't know if this is uh, attributable to people not testing around New Year's. Uh, there are no, um, a lot of testing places were closed. It was hard to, to get tested. So hopefully this is a true um, dip in the number and the rate, uh, in the weekly rate, but we'll, this is TBD in the next few days. So vaccine effectiveness. Um, the good news is vaccines are very, very helpful, still very helpful if you have any type of COVID, uh, Delta, Alpha, um, Omicron, uh, they're very helpful to prevent um, severe disease, death, hospitalizations. But there, we now know that they're much less effective um, against the Omicron if you are talking about two doses. Other vaccines, international vaccines, AstraZeneca and some Sinopharm, Sinovac, uh, have been shown to even to be completely ineffective uh, in some studies. So this was very concerning. And in every study that we have looked at that looks at two dose um, series versus three, so two plus booster, um, very, very consistently, the booster increases the, the rate of protection from severe disease from hospitalizations and even from transmission uh, in every um, one of these studies. And again, all our new studies. Um, this is a recent one that looks specifically at somebody with a two dose of Pfizer. Um, and the little box here is the Delta variant and the round is Omicron. And you can see if you look at the X 
taxes. Um, th these are the progression in terms of weeks since you've been vaccinated. Um, we've known that the um, immunity goes down a little bit, um, but there is a difference, of course, between Delta and Omicron, and you can see this is close to zero. Um, but if you add a Pfizer booster, it really goes up, still less effective for Omicron than Delta. And if you add a, an mRNA, uh, the other one, the Moderna, again, similar issues. And uh, we see the same story with AstraZeneca. As you can see, two doses of AstraZeneca pretty much no protection whatsoever against Omicron. If you add a Pfizer booster, it goes up. 40% is you know, not what we've been dreaming about, but it's decent and it does provide protection from severe disease. And Moderna uh, added to AstraZeneca, again, increases it to 60, but nothing like the 90, 80% um, uh, effectiveness rates that we've seen with, um, with a Delta variant and the, one, the variants before that. And again, studies uh, looking specifically at antibody levels show that with a booster, which is one of the reasons why boost, getting a booster as soon as possible is so incredibly important, does increase the antibody levels. Um, and uh, presumptively, uh, the next logical step is that it would protect you um, much, much more than if you hadn't received the booster. Um, unfortunately, the Omicron is also not, um, has, has shown uh, evasion of um, some of our most common treatments, um, monoclonal antibodies. This is a, an email I got a few days ago. All, of, all the area physicians received it the other day, um, talking about the monoclonal antibody treatments that are available and showing that of the three ones that are currently authorized for use, only one uh, has efficacy against um, Omicron and it's also in short supply. So it really does present uh, an issue, an operational issue, and a, a public health issue to all of us. Um, when we're talking about um, immune escape, it's not just about the vaccines, it's also previous infections. And this is one of the more common questions I get. Oh, I had a, you know, I had COVID three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Uh, I'm, I'm, am I protected? And the answer is no, we are actually seeing a lot of cases of people who had a presumptive Delta infection are now being reinfected with Omicron and we don't yet know whether a previous infection with Omicron will protect you from another infection with Omicron. This is still TBD, and uh, scientists are looking into that. We do know that other than antibodies, which um, are produced when you are vaccinated and when, you're, when you have a previous infection, there are other parts of the immune system that seem to be activated, uh, like the T cells and B cells. But right now, we don't have enough information to see how much protection they offer, uh, especially in comparing uh, comparing them to to booster or to vaccines so everybody wants to talk about the severity and how it's a mild disease it is indeed as dean trainer mentioned a milder disease by all um, the data points that we have had so far from different parts of the world from the us from south africa from the uk um, and it seems to be much less severe also and when you compare vaccinated and unvaccinated boosted and unboosted but because of its en enormous transmissibility, we are seeing a lot of cases, and among all of these cases, even those who are vaccinated and boosted, there are going to be people who are more vulnerable because of other health conditions and other factors that make them um, at risk. And so we are seeing hospitalizations. We're seeing huge impact on individuals and communities and, and businesses, as, as the trainer also mentioned. One of the hypotheses as to why this is more transmissible but less severe lies with this one study from Hong Kong from a week or so ago that showed that the Omicron variant um, multiplies 70 times faster than Delta in the upper airways. So in the, in the airways that lead from the nose to the throat, to the back of the throat, to the lungs, but less so it replicates 10 times less in the lungs. And this may explain why it's so infectious because you talk, you cough, you sneeze, it's all resting in your kind of in your upper airway area, but it doesn't really replicate much in the lungs, therefore not causing that much um, severe disease. So this is very hopeful, but again, these are very early studies and they need to be replicated. Severity, of course, translates sometimes to hospitalizations. And what we're seeing here, and this is from this morning, and these are uh, cases of people and hospitalizations because of COVID, not with COVID. These are two different 
um, concepts, um, that the numbers of, of um, infections rise as do, and this is DC here as well, as do the number of cases in the hospital and the hospitalization rates. And DC unfortunately right now has the highest increase in hospitalizations. But um, there is a what's called a decoupling. So it doesn't, they're not rising in the same level and the, at the same speed. Um, and this is, of course, really, really um, good news for all of us. Uh, imagine if this were as transmissible and, and also um, very, very serious in terms of the severity of disease. And we're also seeing um, less admissions to the ICU and fewer deaths related to um, and uh, to potentially related to this uh, current surge. But because so many more people are going, regardless of how severe they are, even if they're not going to the ICU, um, because of this rise in, in the number and the sheer number, um, hospitals have to cancel all the elective surgeries and procedures. There's oftentimes uh, reports about poor care for other conditions such as uh, stroke or a heart attack. Other uh, deaths uh, have been shown in, in to increase because of um, you know, the healthcare system focused on COVID. And of course, there are also the, the personal issues that visitor policies and not allowing people, sometimes spouses to attend uh, births and, and parents to, both parents to attend um, uh, to their children in the hospital, which is of course on a personal level, very, very upsetting and uh, has a huge impact. A lot of people ask us, you know, yes, it's a milder disease. Everybody talks about it's milder. So why are you overreacting? Why are you doing this? And I think um, Dean Trainer already mentioned this, but mild disease is not necessarily mild in the variety of issues. One is you can still get really, really sick and feel terrible for a few days. There is still a risk for long COVID, um, which a substantial number of the population will experience, as has experienced, and the, the rate right now, depending on which study you look at, is somewhere around 10% of the population, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world with long COVID, even if they had mild disease before. We still have to isolate. So the impact on the family, on childcare, on going to work is enormous. And of course, uh, very importantly, you can still transmit, transmit the disease even if you have zero symptoms and you're infected. And that's been the case all along, which is why the isolation protocols have been put in place. I want to switch a little bit to COVID on campus. We've had our first case uh, in uh, early December. And we have a way of kind of seeing what portion of our posit positive test um, uh, are potentially Omicron versus Delta, which is the other um, variant that's been in the community and dominating the samples. Uh, and as you can see in the chart, the portion of um, what appears to be Omicron, and many of these have been later been proved to be Omicron by uh, genomic sequencing, has gone from you know, less than 20% to basically the majority of them Omicron. So if you're infected right now in DC, you can pretty much presume that this is Omicron and not Delta. Law school positivity rate. This has been going on, and Dean Trainer mentioned the number of cases, um, 61 prior to, this, to December and more than 150 in the last couple of weeks, an enormous positivity rate. This is nearing 20%. And yes, there are potential issues and biases when you calculate something as a positivity rate because you, the denominator can be funny. And, um, and um, But this is tracking exactly the numbers we're seeing everywhere in the region and, and in the country. And if you look at the actual numbers of people at, affiliated with the law center, it is a staggering number in the past two weeks of more than 150 people. We haven't even finished the week. Um, many of you are, if you've been infected, you're somewhere in there, you can see that the number of students, both law students and graduate law students, has been incredibly high and far, far greater than anything we've seen throughout this pandemic. So that alone gives you an indication that there's definitely something going on and it's going on fast and wide and affecting every aspect of, um, of the operation of the university and the law school. So. Dean Trainer already talked about what to expect. Expect a lot of cases, uh, and you probably know a lot of people around you if you're not yourself have been infected already. 
And, and this is something to get used to. Many of us, despite vaccination, despite having been boosted, many of us will be infected in the coming weeks and months um, for sure. Great disruption in the city, at the, at the law school, at the university, very, a lot of strain on general capacity to respond from our public health team to contact tracing and isolation support. We are looking at the data coming in and new studies coming in every day. Um, and what I would say right now is assume that when you're going out, seeing other people, um, assume that you're exposed uh, because most likely you are and you will be. Um, the good news, of course, is that it seems to be very mild in, in the majority of cases. Um, a reminder again that though, um, you know, I, I talked about vaccination and I talked about boosters, this is not, these are not the only tools we have uh, against COVID and the sum of the success in, in lowering the rate of transmission, um, lowering the number of cases in using all of these uh, layers of the Swiss cheese. Um, each one may be a little bit more porous when we come, when we talk about Omicron versus Delta, but together they do provide a certain layer of protection and particularly from, from very, very severe disease and, um, and, and death, the, the vaccine and boosters, um, their contribution cannot be overstated. So I know this is a little bit, um, maybe a little bit scary to hear, but it really does appear to be milder. There's, there, um, the hospitalization rate is not going as fast as the rate of new infections. There are fewer ICU admissions. There's a new pill that's been approved. It's still not widely available to everyone, but hopefully it will be in the coming weeks and months. And then from what we've seen in other countries, and we're tracking them very closely, it looks like that as fast as it went up, um, the numbers have gone down after a peak. And if this is to be, if this is something that's going to be um, happening in the US, and we all hope it, it does, uh, that it will, and that we are going hopefully to see cases uh, starting to decrease pretty rapidly towards the end of January, hence um, what we have been um, designing in terms of the, the current response of the university and the law school. I'm going to stop right here. I know there are a lot of questions, but um, I'll um, have Larry um, take it from here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mishori. Uh, Professor Gaston? Yeah, well, um... Uh, Dr. Mishuri, thank you so much. That was a, um, uh, let's see, am I on? Yes. Um, Dr. Mishuri, thank you very much. Um, that was really so informative. And um, I just want to thank you for, you know, leading the university's response for, you know, uh, know how overwhelming it has been. And the same to you, Dean Trainer. Um, I've really been privileged to work with both of you and, and we've worked really hard to do the, the very best we can. None of us are sure, you know, that we make the right decisions all the time. But one of the things I can be very confident of is, is that we always strive to do it. And the public health um, advisory group at the university level was unanimous in making the recommendation um, that we've made. It's really dispiriting um, to think, you know, after being back, um, you know, seeing smiling eyes, not so much smiles because we're behind masks. Um, uh, and uh, or to, to just to be having to go through this again with all of the anxiety, all of the uncertainty um, is, it, it is, you know, very disappointing to all of us. But I do think that there are, really good reasons to be optimistic, um, certainly optimistic over the next month um, for the reasons that Dr. Mashuri said that we've seen globally um, large surges. In fact, we call them wildfires and then a deep uh, drop. Um, also that the, uh, the Omicron variant does appear to be uh, have milder disease. Um, I should also say I'm very confident in the longer term that I think that as we are heading into 2022, 
um, we are going to see ourselves in a marked, markedly different position um, uh, as we go along, and we'll we'll be getting stronger and stronger in that position um, uh, as as the months go on. L let me try to explain why. Um, you know, first of all, we've we've been focusing for two years on cases. Um, and the law center and the university generally has been remarkably effective at preventing cases at extraordinarily low um, case rates and virtually zero onward transmissions on our campus itself. Most of the few cases have come uh, to the campus and our layered measures have pre prevented that. It's very clear that Omicron is so incredibly infectious. If you think back to Dr. Mishuri's slides and you look at chickenpox, which is just a little bit um, uh, less uh, infectious with an R naught rate, it's a little lower than, uh, with, with the Delta a little lower than, than, than chickenpox. Chickenpox, if you put somebody in a room with chickenpox, more than nine out of 10 people will get um, the infection. And by all accounts, um, the uh, Omicron variant is at least twice as contagious. And some have said, you know, three to four and even five times more contagious. So we're dealing with a very um, uh, highly transmissible um, virus. And so I think we have to uh, not have an expectation that we're going to prevent cases but we have a very strong expectation that we can have our due diligence in making sure that people stay healthy. Now, how do we do that? The main uh, way we do that is through our policy of vaccination and boosters. Although it was very disappointing to see the gradual decline, in fact, the very um, major decline in effectiveness um, of vaccines uh, between Delta and Omicron. And even with the booster, you, you could see the antibody levels starting to um, wane over time. That's for case transmissions, which is the measure we've been using. But these vaccines and particularly the boosters have been very effective at preventing people from getting severely ill. Um, going to the hospital, needing uh, uh, intensive uh, care beds, um, and certainly of dying. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Renit talked about uh, the Pfizer antiviral, um, which is a very effective, at least in clinical trials, um, uh, pill that you can take at home um, that can significantly reduce uh, serious disease and death. Um, the bad news is, is that hospitals are overwhelmed now, so, and, and the supply of the Pfizer antiviral is extraordinarily low. But President Biden has um, purchased um, uh, tens of millions of doses, um, and we expect that we're going to have that uh, antiviral medication in, in greater supply over the next month or two. Uh, let me just uh, finish by saying that, um, you know, this will end. We're in an extraordinarily different position even today than we were um, six months or a year ago. Um, we've got highly effective vaccines. We've got much better therapeutics. We have much better knowledge um, of uh, this virus. Um, we are going to always have to learn to live with COVID-19. But I think that the signs are that by the end of this year, 2022, at least in the United States, if uh, it'll take longer globally, um, we're, we are going to learn to live with it. Um, we're going to be able to manage the disease. Doesn't mean we're going to prevent people from getting COVID-19 any more than we can uh, prevent them from getting um, you know, severe viral infections like influenza. But we have really good tools um, to keep people safe, to keep them healthy, uh, to keep them out of hospital and to keep them from dying. And so I am confident, I'm hopeful um, that by the time uh, this month ends, we will be back in session. Um, and I'm even more confident that over the next several months and certainly by the time we 
come together next September for our um, uh, for the next academic term, that we're going to be in an extraordinarily better position. Um, if you look at history, um, most pandemics have a, a two to three year cycle, um, and I think that with with all of the scientific tools that we have now, we're going to be in a good shape. So we just need to hold on a little bit longer. And I think the future is going to be much brighter than it has been. Um, over to you, Dean Trainer. Well, thanks very much, uh, Professor Gaston and, and uh, Dr. Mishur. You know, what I wanted to do was, you know, to have you talk and give us an overview about kind of where the pandemic is and provide that background of, the time when it's really crucial to understand kind of the health concerns. So thank you. Um, actually, let me, one thing that uh, a number of questions have focused on is essentially the trade-off. Uh, you know that you know some have said you know the real mental health costs from students not being physically in in the classroom, the isolation, um, and that you know that's something that you know as we've gone through we're you know, we've very much kept in mind. Um, so, but what I'd like to do is to start on kind of the way in which that entered into the decision-making process. So let me start with you, Professor Gaston, and then uh, and Dr. Mishori, uh, kind of, you know, thinking about the mental health issues. Yeah, I mean, that's been very um, high on our mind. Um, as, as we all know, um, education from you know preschool to primary and secondary through to um, university and law school um, really only works if we're in person. Um, there are enormous mental health consequences um, to, to being remote and also to being fearful and uncertain um, about um, COVID-19 and what effects not just that it has on us but we worry a lot about our families, and particularly if we have young children or grandchildren um, that aren't vaccinated, um, or if we've got um, uh, people in our household or, or we care about who are immunocompromised or, or have other um, uh, risk factors. Um, and so we, we really, that weighs heavily. I know I can speak personally. I think I can speak for Dr. Mishuri and, and everybody in the university. And I know um, Dean Trainer feels this way, is, is that we want to get back um, uh, to uh, being in person. Um, we think we can do it safely in terms of um, preventing people from getting very sick. Um, and we understand the enormous burdens that it takes to have the anxiety of this disease, um, plus being remote and isolated and alone. Um, so we're determined to do everything that we can to get us back to normal. And as I said at the end, Dean Trainer, I, I really am hopeful um, that over the next several months, we are going to become, be in a, in a much um, better position and uh, really start to get back to a semblance of normality. Uh, normality. Right. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Gustin. And one thing I just want to frame and then turn it over back to Dr. Mishore. Um, what, you know, what we're doing for January is different than what we were doing you know, a year and a half ago and a year ago. Um, so right now, with respect to education, we're focused on classes. And you know, the core idea is that a time in which you know, a, a fair number of people will be in isolation or quarantining, both students and faculty, that the best way to deliver the educational experience in that what we hope is a limited time period is online. But we're also doing things that bring people to campus that we weren't doing a year and a half ago. So the library is open. Uh, and right now uh, we're working with Dr. Mishori about can we open the gym? Uh, you know, can and can we bring back campus ministry to campus? So, you know, the classes in January will be online. But because we're very concerned about making sure that people have the opportunity to, to contact and come back into community, we're looking at other ways in which people can be back on campus, even during the period in which the classes themselves will be online. Uh, Dr. Mishore, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I can echo what um, Professor Gostin was saying. I mean, it's, it's an intense and often frustrating balancing act because we 
recognize and consider the mental health impact on students and how many of them want to go back to in-person learning. At the same time, we have to take into consideration the enormous, sometimes paralyzing, sometimes certainly uncertainty, but fear and anxiety of people who are very scared to go back to campus and don't want to be there, don't want to be in person, especially if they're older, uh, have other medical conditions, or as, as Dr. Go uh, Professor Gostin was saying, um, have young children or other household members who cannot be vaccinated. So it's constant balancing act between um, those two populations and whoever is there is in between. And, and this is one of the features of this pandemic. I mean, I think instinctively we all think about ourselves, but I, I would urge everybody to look at how it impacts you, but also consider how it's impacting other people who are unlike you because of their role in society, because of their job, because of their age, because of who they have to care for. And that is one of the toughest things managing um, our response because we as a university have to consider all of these populations. They all make us one institution and um, and it's, it's tough. It's really, really incredibly tough. And I think we cannot get through this by only catering to one group. And we cannot get through this without compassion, without understanding, without flexibility and patience. Thank you, Dr. Mishori. Actually, uh, Dean Falhaber, could I ask you about kind of our thinking about the online courses in January and the pedagogy? You know, why we did that rather than moving towards a hybrid model? Sure. So thank you all for, for being here. And I actually just want to start off by echoing what Dean Trainer and Dr. Mishori and Professor Gostin said. We did not want to make this decision, right? We did not want to go remote for the first two weeks of class. Faculty don't like teaching on Zoom. We're worried about student mental health. We're worried about mental health for everyone. So this was a hard decision for us to make. But we had to make the decision for two reasons. One reason that we're not doing hybrid classes is because we were responding to feedback from faculty who taught hybrid classes last semester and from students who were in those classes. This isn't to say that in the future we won't do hybrid classes. We will work to make hybrid classes as good as they possibly can be if we need to provide hybrid classes. But for this two week period, we were responding to concerns that we heard from faculty and from students. But more important, are the operational concerns. You can't have a hybrid class if everyone is remote anyway. And you can't have a hybrid class if you can't run an institution. And I just wanna emphasize what Dr. Mishori was saying. The reason that we made this choice is because we think a large proportion of our population is going to end up contracting Omicron. And there are isolation and quarantine requirements. So even if it's a minor case, there are still going to be people who are required to stay home for 10 days under DC rules. We can't run a school if we don't have security officers, if we don't have facility, if we don't have our team of facilities, if we don't have our maintenance staff. And so we can't have in-person classes, even hybrid in-person classes, if we're worried about those operational concerns. So it was a combination of the operational concerns and also the feedback that we got about hybrid. And I also wanna emphasize this says nothing about what we will do starting on January 31st. You should not think that this choice to go remote is sort of opening the door to remote. This was just for these two weeks because of the advice we were getting from our public health team and the predictions about the next few weeks. So um, we know this is tough for a lot of people. We know that our faculty are doing everything they can to make those first two weeks as exciting for students as possible and to make sure that everybody feels involved in classes. Um, but this was a hard decision and it was a decision because of the operational concerns. Right. You know, that puts it you know, very well. It really was driven by operational concerns, which are very different from where we were a year ago. The idea that if you have a big percentage of the students, you know, watching a class online, the hybrid class isn't going to work. And if the people who actually run the, the, the campus, if the police officers and the, and the facilities people aren't there, it just won't work. So, you know, we very much hope that we're back in the classroom on January 31st. But that's what, that underlay the decision that we made uh, for the start of the semester. So let me, um, kind of a couple of kind of very tailored, smaller questions. Um, 
Will we change, Dr. Mishori, will we change the mask rule uh, for the next uh, moving forward? What kind of masks people have to wear? Yeah, so we um, have put in an order of about 100,000 uh, N95s and KN95s, and the first 30,000, um, I understand, is um, of the first uh, deliveries happening today uh, on the main campus and will be distributed to the law center. So we'll be available to anyone who wishes um, to use one. We are not going to require it, but we are very, very, very strongly recommending that anyone and everyone wear the highest grade mask that they can have. And of course, wear it in a in a, an appropriate way that is fitted over the nose and the mouth, because if it's dangling um, below your chin, it's not going to be helpful, even if it's a, an N95 respirator. So there's definitely a very, very, very strong recommendation to use the higher grade masks moving forward. Uh, starting now, if you don't have one, you will be able to get several um, through the, the school. Yeah, the studies are unanimously showing that higher grade masks do a much better job at preventing transmission. And so we do really encourage KN95s or, or N95 masking wherever possible. Um, so another question that's related to masks, is it the administration's belief that high quality masks worn correctly don't provide sufficient protection against transmission in classroom settings uh, even in the event that positive cases slip through the test and isolate protocol. I think we have to remember that um, for a mask to be effective, it has to be worn. And in, in the classroom, we're, ma we're making that choice for you. You have to wear a mask. But a lot of the transmissions occur in the community. You go, you go to, uh, so it has to be coupled with other behavioral changes. You go to a bar, you go to a restaurant, you can go have dinner with friends, um, you ride, uh, you know, you, you do, uh, you know, other activities in the community without a mask, then you're not going to be protected. So it's not just about being protected in one location. If you consistently wear an N95, K95 mask, you will be protected in any setting that you go to, but it has to be worn properly and, and consistently. Uh, anything you want to add, uh, Professor Gaston? No, I mean, I think that says it all. I mean, you know, I mean, you sh we shouldn't think of even high quality masks as again, kind of a bulletproof shield because Omicron is so infectious and, you know, but uh, the studies do demonstrate that if it's, if it, when it's worn and when it's worn effectively and correctly, um, that it significantly reduces transmission. So we don't want to, we're not going to promise that, that there's not going to be cases or even onward transmission cases, um, but we can say that we're using literally every tool that science knows um, to keep people safe, starting with vaccines, but also ventilation, uh, masking, um, uh, all of the tools that we've 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 learned over two years, we've we've implemented. I don't know anything more that we could do to keep our our community safe and functioning well. So uh, another number of people have asked about the decision on January 18th and and benchmarks. Uh, what you know is there a you know, is there a benchmark that will be relevant to determining whether we return to in-person classes on January 31st? How would you respond to that, Dr. Mishori? Yeah, as I mentioned, we're constantly monitoring numbers and infectivity rates, uh, case positivity rates. So the, the most important thing we're looking for is a drop in the cases. And once we see a drop, it's going to, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over a couple of weeks. Um, and so we're, as, a, as everyone here said, um, we really, really want to go back to in person. And I don't have a number for you just yet, uh, whether it's, you know, 5% positivity rate. Uh, we'll have to see how the virus is behaving in the community when people are start coming back from other states um, or, um, you know, uh, whether the some infections are being picked up locally or um, during travel. But uh, again, with as much hope as we can, and based on the little data that we have so far, hopefully by the end 
of the month or uh, 30th or 29th, who knows, there is no specific date, we'll see a significant drop in the case positivity rate, then, um, you know, we're not, we're not looking at COVID zero. COVID zero is a thing of the past. It's unattainable. This is not what we're looking for. There will not be a COVID zero anywhere, anywhere in the world. And every country that attempted to enact policies looking for COVID zero pretty much failed. And, and Professor Gosson, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's at least China, my impression. China is still trying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, COVID zero is not our intent. And I, I personally do not think that it's doable. No. So we're exactly. looking at a much lower infectivity rate. Um, and, um, you know, I can't, whether it's going back to 1% or is it three or at five or, you know, 10%, um, I don't know yet. Um, but we're going to be looking every day to for all the reasons that we can gather to give us the, um, the data that that suggests that we can go back to fully remote and hopefully it'll be a couple of weeks from now. I mean, yeah. to fully in person. Yeah, I think we're looking at, at a very clear downward um, trajectory of, of, of case positivity rates. First and foremost, we'll also be looking at our, at the um, Washington DC vicinity um, to, to see wh whether those rates are tracking in the same way they are in our community. And also I think it'll be important to see whether or not um, uh, hospitals um, gain greater capacity, and also whether um, our population, as we expected, is staying relatively healthy and out of hospital, even if they're getting COVID. Um, so all of those things are really important. Um, and But we, we, every sign that we think we can predict, and we do so with, you know, with humility, um, suggests that we'll be in that position by the end of January. Um, I have a question for Dean Bellaconia. She can join us. Uh, Dean Bellaconia, can we personally choose to study or work remotely or in a hybrid fashion after January if campus, if classes resume in person? Thank you, Dean Turner, for this question and to the students in particular and staff who've been asking this question. Um, as Dr. Mashore, uh, as Dr. Mashore and Professor Gostin just mentioned, the focus of our preventive of, of our measures has shifted somewhat from what we're doing in the fall, which is eliminating any transmission to risk reduction, right? This is because according to many accounts, Omicron is less severe across the board, not just for those in the best of health, but less severe across the board. And the expectation is we're gonna have some transmission on campus after we reopen, but with the measures we've put in, in place, the consequences of that transmission will be less significant. Now, as was also mentioned earlier, hybrid instruction, which would result if staff and students and faculty were to choose what, what they were comfortable with, is hybrid instruction is essentially a, a Frankenstein. No one really likes it. People will choose it because it's more comfortable, more consistent with their anxiety levels about COVID as a general measure. And so there's a real coordinate, Kyber presents a real coordination challenge. If we give students, faculty, staff the choice of what to do, we end up in a hybrid universe by and large. So we are not currently planning a, a, a universe in which faculty, students, and staff would choose their mode of participation on campus. Having said that, if you believe you are personally at severe risk of significant consequences, there are procedures that the university has put in place that you can seek an accommodation for faculty and staff. That is through the IDEA office for any sort of personal, for personal circumstances. And for students, that is the Dean of Students office. All of those offices are taking into in fact the, the specifics of the Omicron variant and how that might manifest given your particular health situation. I'm not gonna go into any detail. But our approach to handling individual requests is going to, main, to essentially remain the same as it was in the fall, but with the different, different variables that are put into the mix in deciding what, what accommodations would be appropriate for faculty, students, and staff. Thank you very much, Dean Bell and Konya. Uh, we've got about five minutes left. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mshuri a series of questions about um, boosters, and then I want to have a couple uh, on kind of people who've had COVID. So the questions on boosters, um, you know, we're requiring boosters. Um, why are shots required even if you've had COVID? 
someone asks. Somebody else, uh, when is the best time to get a booster after getting COVID? Somebody else asks, and what do you do if you had COVID over break and your doctor recommends waiting to get a booster? And the final booster question is, uh, will we move to requiring a second booster uh, at some point? Okay, I know we don't have much time, so very quickly, I think the booster question, why do we need it? Is it helpful? I think I've presented a few slides. There are multiple other studies from the Delta days to uh, specifically even more so the Omicron days showing how really incredibly effective they are in preventing death and, uh, and severe disease. So um, that's as, why do we require them? Number two, uh, you had recently been infected. There's no huge rush, but there are studies that show that what's called natural immunity from an infection uh, is not as robust um, as a vaccine mediated immunity. And so that is part of the rationale behind re um, requiring people who have had a recent infection to get a booster. Is there a rush to get it right away? No. Can you get it? You can get it as soon as you're done with isolation. So the day after you're done with isolation, you can technically get a booster. We often give people two to four weeks uh, sort of time to kind of get, get, uh, get it scheduled. So there's no huge rush, but we do require it. And if you need an extension, um, um, let us know and we can provide that with proof of uh, having been um, uh, infected recently. And I think those are the three questions or did I miss, what did I miss? Uh, did you talk about the second booster? Oh, the second booster. So um, it's interesting. Second booster, uh, uh, as some, some of you may know, Israel has, is the first country in the world right now to um, provide a fourth shot, a, a second booster uh, to people who are at high risk over 65 or over 60 and those with, uh, who are immunocompromised. Uh, we're all following the, the research and the science. Um, the decision was based um, just kind of by you know, the logical deduction that if one booster is better uh, and then maybe a second one will be even better. There is no um, scientific evidence at the moment. So we're all waiting for the data to come from Israel. Um, they were the first one of the first countries to require the booster period. And on population level studies, we have seen that the second booster on a population level really did reduce uh, transmission, infection, hospitalizations and death. So we're waiting right now. Uh, this is definitely not, uh, maybe it's part of the conversation here, but it's not required and it uh, hasn't even been decided or discussed by um, any public, uh, public health uh, organizations uh, at the national level. And Larry, I'm sure you have something to say. Yeah, about and that. We, would, we would absolutely want to wait for FDA and CDC guidance on that. Um, I know in our scientific circles, uh, nobody's rushing um, to think about fourth fourth boosters. Um, and what we need to understand a little bit better how it wanes. But remember, our, our, our metric is not, does the booster prevent cases? Our metric is, does it keep us healthy and safe and out of the hospital? Which, and so far, three doses have been ample to do that. Um, and there, there's no indication uh, uh, that that it that it won't going forward. And then two final linked questions because we're right at the hour. Um, someone says, "I tested positive over break. Do I still need to test before returning to campus? And if I had COVID, will I continue to test positive for some period moving forward?" Yeah, so it really depends on what um, test you're using. Um, the recommendation uh, from us and from all public health experts is to not get a PCR test um, for 90 days once after you um, are have been infected, uh, because yes, the PCR test can remain positive for a long time. Um, so recommendation do not get PCR, you can get an antigen test, especially if you are symptomatic, you may be asked to get a PCR test if you are symptomatic, but for return to campus, no PCR and we're, um, and yes, antigen test. That's right. Very good. Okay. Um, so we're now at the hour. Uh, we will, uh, two things, we've uh, made a recording of this. And so we'll make available to people who want to view the recording of this uh, discussion, this town hall. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Mishori's slides will also be available. Um, so I just want to, uh, first of all, thank everybody um, who, is, who has been participating in this conversation. This was, it's a tough decision, but, you know, we're very much focused on this moment right now, uh, this moment where 
we're looking at a spike and you know what that means for the operations of the campus and not having people in the classroom and having to have it online. So those really on, uh, underlie our decisions to at the very start of the semester, be online in terms of operations and classes. But we also have uh, the libraries open and we hope to have gym and uh, campus ministry open so that people can kind of move through the isolation. And I very much hope uh, that we're able to come back on campus uh, and have classes you know, as soon as possible and I hope that that's what I announced on January 18th. So thank you. You know, we had uh, almost 400 people were participating. Uh, I want to thank Dean Valenconi and Dean Falhauber for uh, your participation. And I particularly want to thank uh, Professor Gostin and Dr. Mishori. You really have been guiding us through the thinking of how to proceed for the past 22 months. And we're just so very fortunate to have that guidance and to have you with us today. So thank you very much. And thank you all. Take care. Thank you.